All right, guys, wow, good to see all of you. Uh, happy what, Wednesday, happy first day of starting apologetics. Hope you guys are excited. Uh, let me begin in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together and for this study. Uh, we want to glorify you. We want to see your name honored in this world, and we long for our loved ones and our friends and family and co-workers to know you. Uh, we know that you don't need us to save your people, and we know that you can use a dull axe, but we want to be sharp tools in your hands and to be equipped to know how to defend the gospel and the faith that we cherish and the truth of your word. So help us to do that. Uh, give me clarity as I teach and explain, and may your name be honored in our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So we are going to embark on an eight to nine, maybe 10 week study on apologetics. And uh, we're about to have a baby, Lord willing. So there may be a week that I'm not here and that's okay. I prepared ahead of time uh, what you guys will do uh, then. So don't worry about that. Now, you guys all have your books, expository, apologetics. Uh, you guys all had a chance to read intro chapter one. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, good, good. So just a word on this book, uh, expository apologetics. Expository, uh, we do expository preaching here, um, and that, that means our message is, is shaped by the word. Uh, our sermons are shaped by the word, they are formed by the word, we get our outline from the word, everything comes out of here. Uh, that is expository. Uh, that's our expository preaching. And so expository apologetics is apologetics that is shaped by the word of God. Uh, God determines and ordains how we do uh, apologetics and how we understand apologetics. So that is what I believe Vodi Bakum is getting at with this title here, expository apologetics. Uh, now, uh, if you've done the reading, uh, great. And if you haven't, that's okay. If you've done the reading, you just have a connection point with our study. What I've done is I've read the book, and each week I've pulled out themes and concepts and, and points from each chapter or chapters, and uh, we're just going to magnify them and, and hopefully simplify them and, and dive down deep and so we can understand what's going on here. Uh, that's what I've done. So if you've read it, you've, you're just one step ahead, and maybe the lessons will come more clearly to you. Let's see, what else we got here? Um, you'll see page numbers throughout your worksheets. Um, that's just referencing this, that's all it is. Um, I'll try, I'll try, not my best, but I'll try uh, to reference certain things where I'm getting my concepts and things like that. Uh, we won't cover everything uh, in each session. Sessions will overlap and that's okay, so if I don't get to a certain theme or topic, uh, it may be coming, it may be coming. So. Uh, today, we're just going to lay some groundwork. That's all we're doing today is laying some groundwork. This is part one of two uh, for just intro in chapter one. For those of you who want to go uh, deeper in your studies, I recommend these books are fantastic for apologetics. Uh, apologetics uh, by John Frame and then uh, Greg Bonson. Yes, Greg Bonson, Always Ready. These are fantastic books um, for apologetics and, of course, uh, Evangelism by John MacArthur is very good. This was actually the first book by John MacArthur I've ever read, and it introduced me to John MacArthur. And then from there, I, I looked up where his church was, and then I moved there. What did you guys talk about? What, what comes to mind when uh, you think about apologetics or doing apologetics? What comes to mind? First thing. Defen defending the faith, yes. Apologia, defense, good. We'll get there. We'll talk about that. What else? What else? Yep, being prepared. First Peter 3.15. Always be prepared. Good. Emotions. Uh, excitement, right? Are you guys excited for this study? To learn? Uh, how many are terrified to start evangelizing? Nobody. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys are awesome. Yes. Yes, there's some kind of apprehension to that. Any? Yes, John. Mm. I feel more like I might be closer to that than a sharp sword. Amen. And so Me too. Take a little comfort 
<laughs> yes, he can use anything. He can use anything. That's right. That's right. How many of you think of like, a, when you think of apologetics, you think of like James White up here and then another really smart atheist up here, and that's just apologetics. How many people? Yeah, typically. That is not what we're doing. We are taking apologetics to the street and equipping you, uh, anybody, not, not just the academic, not just the intellectual elite, the ivory tower guy. Uh, we are equipping you to be able to answer anybody, anybody, and to give a, a reason for the hope that is in you, um, even to answer guys with PhDs, right, and people, college professors. Uh, you can answer them, and you can give an, an, a reasonable defense for the hope that is in you and your worldview and why you believe the gospel. Uh, and uh, hopefully, my, my, my hope is that we can get to the place where we are equipped enough to be able to show even PhD professors and whoever you come across that their worldview just falls short. It's unreasonable, it's foolish, it's absurd. Um, in a gentle and kind way, doing that. Um, so uh, when we talk about apologetics, um, I know my wife and I, uh, we uh, were terrified the first time we tried going door to door or bus station or Thai temple. And then after the first time, we were just there every single week doing it for years. I don't know how long we did it for. Um, but that, that first time is tough, but there is fear uh, at the beginning. And I want, just, I want to read a cover letter from a brochure I, I, I heard about the other day. Uh, this is very appropriate, I believe, to begin with. This lady writes, I was 26 years old before I heard the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ for the first time. I believed it as soon as I understood it and committed my life to Jesus when I was 27. When I look back to all the preceding years, I can only think, what a waste. Why didn't anyone tell me sooner? Please, never think that we have all heard. The billboards and radio sermons frequently do not communicate the gospel, and too many good Christians fear to speak of Jesus to us lest we be offended. Believe me, being offended is better than being condemned for eternity. I think that's very appropriate and uh, should cast away all fears. Uh, being offended is better than being condemned. So when we engage in ap apologetics, we engage in a battle for the truth, for the truth. And this is God's truth. We engage in a battle for uh, reason and logic. And, uh, and uh, I thought this would be a fun exercise to do. Um, Apologetics has a lot to do with critical thinking and being able to um, take a truth claim that someone you're talking to is saying and think critically about that and question it. So I thought it'd be a fun exercise to uh, do number two. Is that number two? No, number three. Uh, read the following top three Google definitions for truth and what's wrong with them. Find what's wrong with them. I just Googled truth and these are the first three definitions that have come up and they're all wrong or they all fall short, and I want us to see how they fall short um, using critical thinking. So let's start with the first one together. Uh, so the first one is the quality or state of being true. What's wrong with that? Anyone? We're sinners, we're not true. <laughs> no, we're not true. <laughs> well, uh, you can't use the word in the definition, right? I mean, that's, yeah, that's just, truth is truth. Okay, well, I need, that's, I need more than that. So that was a tough one. Next one. That which is true, again, okay, or in accordance with fact or reality. In accordance with fact or reality. Okay, critical thinking. Whose reality? Whose reality? Yes, my reality, your reality. Whose reality are we talking about? God's reality? Okay, good, good. A fact or belief that is accepted as true. A fact or belief that is accepted as true. What's wrong with that one? It is accepted as true. That's, that's just mere opinion at this point. Um, you can accept it as true, but it may not be true. So these, these statements don't do justice to what truth is. Number four, which of these truth claims is actually true? Homosexuality is wrong, homosexuality is right. These are truth claims, and which one is true? Hopefully you guys know. <laughs> okay, homosexuality is wrong. Okay, thank you, yes, that's wrong. We've got some work to do, Pastor. Okay, how do you know that's wrong? 
God's word. Yes, the Bible says so. God says so. That is our standard for truth. Now, how would you prove it to be true? How would you, if someone says that to you, that's truth claim, and you said, no, that's not true. How would you prove that to be true? Okay, you just take him to the word. Take him to 1 Timothy. Uh, yes, uh, take him to the Bible. And uh, I want to show you this. I got to use the whiteboard. It's right here. So if, if someone were to say to you, okay, well, I believe that your statement is false uh, because the Bible uh, says otherwise. This is what the Bible says. Let me show you. And they say, well, okay, that's, uh, that's your thought. That's your reasoning. Uh, how do you prove the Bible is true? And we'll get there in another session, but I just want to uh, whet your appetite here. So if I say, if I have a truth claim here, if I say the Bible is true, or this is, this is my truth claim, the Bible is true, and I'm going to prove it using reason or something. I'm going to prove it using evidence or reason or whatever. Um, if I do that, if I, if I try to prove the Bible with something else, what becomes my ultimate authority? Something else. Something else. This becomes my ultimate authority. Reason then becomes my ultimate authority, but the Bible is the ultimate authority. Um, and so we could use evidence to prove the Bible or reason to prove the Bible. You can do that because it is true, but we fall uh, to the Bible as our ultimate authority, and I don't need, essentially, in, in principle, I don't need to prove it. I don't need to prove it. Um, reality, as God has uh, determined it, states that this is the ultimate authority. Okay? So we'll get there in, more, uh, uh, in due time, but uh, that's, that's how we would prove it to be true, and uh, we'll, we'll get there. So this is where apologetics comes in. When we look at question number five, what right do I have to claim that I know the truth? What right do I have to claim that I know the truth? It's not just my truth, your truth. This is, I know the truth, and you are wrong. And we've, we've kind of talked about it. What right do I have to say that? To say that you are wrong, and this is the right way to go, or this is the truth. I feel like the mic is kind of intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. If it's, if it's biblical truth, if it's in here. I can say I know for a fact that what I'm saying is true, okay? Uh, if it's in here, this is expository apologetics. Uh, our apologetics is shaped by this, okay? It all comes out of this, okay? Because I hold to the word of God, I, I know that what I'm claiming is true. So what is truth? Pilate asks, yes, Yes. Yeah, I know him, too. Yeah, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and I know the God of truth. Amen. And I have the Holy Spirit of truth in me as well. Amen. Number six, Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? This is very important to know. Uh, I mentioned the definition earlier. How would you guys define truth? What is truth? If you guys have been in my student group, you guys kind of hopefully remember this. What is truth? What is, it, what is needed in this definition of truth? How about that? God, somewhere in this definition, maybe? God's word. Yeah, God's word in this definition. Yes, truth is, I'll say it a couple times, truth is that which corresponds to reality as God has determined it. Truth is that which corresponds to reality as God has determined it. Okay, that is truth. And you can put in parentheses, in his word. Truth is that which corresponds to reality as God has determined it in his word. Okay, that is truth. And that is nowhere on Google, I'll tell you that. Okay. So, again, when we engage in apologetics, we are engaged in a battle for the truth. Um... So this term, apologia, or apologetics, appears 17 times in the New Testament, and uh, you can translate it as defense or vindication. And uh, here's some biblical examples for you. 1 Peter 3.15, you should memorize this. This will uh, be referred to over and over again in our study. 
Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, and we will unpack this. We'll do an exposition of this in due time. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense, apologia, make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet do this with gentleness and reverence. Acts 22, 1, brothers, brothers, or brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you, my apologia. Uh, don't think of apologetics as apologizing. We don't apologize for anything. We don't apologize for the word of God. This is defending the truth. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 3, my defense, my apologia to those who examine me is this. And then in Philippians 1, uh, Paul says, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, in the apologia of the gospel, And that's really what we're doing. We are defending the truth of the gospel, that this is the truth, and there is no other truth, okay? So defining apologetics, defining apologetics. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Um, I can slow down, and if you have any questions, just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Defining apologetics. This is a a multifaceted um, uh, uh, thing, I guess. I'll just say thing, apologetics. And so I, I've gathered together a number of definitions that all kind of uh, hit the facet of the diamond that is apologetics. Uh, Vodi Bakum offers a fantastic definition. He says, knowing what we believe, that's the gospel, and why we believe it, that it's grounded in the truth, and being able to communicate that to others in a humble, winsome, biblical manner. That's a great, great definition of apologetics. Next one. Apologetics is the art. I like this definition because it says art of defending a claim against objections. Yes, there's a science involved to apologetics, but it's also a skill, an art that can be developed over time, and you can learn and grow in apologetics and evangelism. Uh, the The discipline that teaches Christians how to give a reason for their hope, like Justin was saying, uh, teaches you, you can grow, you can learn, Next definition, the application of Scripture to unbelief. Uh, That's expository. We are, again, being shaped in our apologetics by the word, the application of this to unbelief. That branch of Christian theology which, which seeks to provide a rational justification for the truth claims of the Christian faith. Uh, we don't follow a blind faith. There's, there's all the rationality in the world to believe the gospel. And uh, that's what we're going to aim to show our, our, um, the people we're talking to. The demonstration that Christianity, and I would add alone, Christianity alone is reasonable. The worldview of Christianity is reasonable. And thus, A, to assure Christians that their faith is not idiotic. Uh, it's not a blind faith, as I said. And B, to clear away the obstacles and objections that keep non-believers from considering the arguments and evidence for the truth of Christianity. Now, here's a question for you guys. What if we were to clear away all obstacles and to answer all the evidence that they need uh, to to believe the Bible and to believe the gospel? Would that that work? Would that cause them to then bend the knee to Christ and repent of all their sin and turn to him? No, no, Uh, that's that's not the purpose, or that's that's uh, that's not our job. Uh, the, the problem with sinners, as we'll get to, is not an intellectual issue. It's not that they just need to be convinced. It's not that they just really want to believe in God, but there's just not enough evidence. Uh, no, if they see someone rise from the dead, they still would not believe. God needs to do a work in the heart. So apologetics, we can, we can shut the mouth, but God must open, open the heart. Um, but there is still a reason for apologetics, and we'll get there. Um, so th- it's a sin issue that we're dealing with. Uh, They are actively suppressing the truth, and we want to show them that they're doing that. We want to show them, and this is a way to show them sin and cause them uh, and and ask them to repent of their sin. Okay, so the the next definition, the task of defending and commending the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a Christ-like, context-sensitive and audience-specific manner. That's why I've I've added this definition, a context-sensitive and audience-specific specific. Uh, There is a flexibility to apologetics and evangelism in the Bible. How Jesus evangelized Nicodemus is not the same as how he evangelized the woman at the well. How Paul evangelized uh, the Jews is not the same as how he did with the Greeks or the Gentiles. There is a flexibility to it. It's context 
specific. Um, so, my favorite definition uh, comes from Paul in 2 Corinthians 10. This is, this is the definition, I believe, of apologetics in verse 5. I'll start in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the tearing down of strongholds. These are, these are strongholds in the mind, right? We're, we're after truth. We're after worldviews. As we tear down speculations, speculations, thoughts, ideologies, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is a beautiful definition of apologetics and evangelism. We are seeking to tear down their speculations and to take their thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. That is exactly what we aim to do. That is a beautiful definition. So, um, what is the definition, or the, the difference, I should say, between apologetics and evangelism? Uh, we'll just make it very clear at the outset by uh, filling in these blanks here. Apologetics tears down false speculations. That's from 2 Corinthians 10. Tearing down speculations, Paul says. Evangelism builds up in gospel truth. Apologetics tears down. Evangelism builds up in gospel truth, seeking their obedience to Christ in the world of thought through the gospel. Evangelism is the what of the gospel, Apologetics is the why of the gospel, why you should believe the gospel. Evangelism is directed toward the proclamation of the gospel. Apologetics is directed toward the justification of the gospel. Apologetics, as I said, closes the mouth. And evangelism, I have to add the parentheses here, Evangelism does not open the heart. Evangelism provides the God-ordained means for the Holy Spirit to open the heart. That's a mouthful, but that's the way it is. So apologetics and evangelism go together. Uh, you can't have one without the other. They are two sides of the same coin. Okay, any questions so far? Any questions? Okay, we're, we're tracking. Everyone's still good? Good? Okay. Okay. So in a nutshell, what is uh, presuppositional? Uh, Vodi Bakum uses this word on page 14 of your book, and uh, let's, just, let's just talk about it real quick. We're going to have a whole lesson on this uh, in a week or two. Uh, presuppositional apologetics. Let me just uh, wet the appetite here. Let me just get you going. Uh, presuppositional apologetics. I, I gave you the answer here. You can just draw an arrow. Uh, presupposes the truth of the Bible. Uh, it presupposes the truth of the Bible, and I'll explain that in due time. Uh, maybe more on that next week. Uh, number two, uh, apologetics, presuppositional apologetics, is not a dispute over facts, but of worldviews. Worldviews. And uh, we see this in page 27, 157, and chapter 8 gets there in, in detail. It's not a dispute of our facts, but of worldviews. We don't just ask unbelievers to add Jesus to their worldview. Uh, it's, he's not like whipped cream on your dessert. You know, it, if you just add Jesus, I know you have a great life and all is well, but just add Jesus and you'll be a little happier. That's not what we're doing. That is not what we're doing. That's not apologetics. Uh, we are aiming uh, to be the means through which God can make him completely new, a new com a completely new way of thinking, uh, all things made new in his mind, in his heart, in his will, and everything about the inner man, submitting to the lordship of Christ and being guided from now on uh, by his word. That's what we're going for. We can't do it, but that's what we're going for in his life, bowing the knee to Christ in your thoughts, in your worldview. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, apologetics aims to show that the Christian worldview is the only reasonable worldview. All other worldviews must borrow, borrow in some way from the Christian worldview, and uh, he'll get to that later in chapter 8. So if you deny the Christian worldview, you are left with absurdity. 
absurdity. Every other worldview is absurd when you get down to it. Only the Christian worldview can account for morality, ethics, the uniformity of nature, logical thinking, etc. You can't borrow from the Christian worldview and yet deny it's God. But that's what every unbeliever has to do. They have to do that. So what do I mean by that? Let's talk about that. What do I mean by borrowing from the Christian worldview? Can, can we talk about some examples of borrowing from the Christian worldview? What's an example? Morality, morality yes. What, so let's get deeper into that. How do they borrow morality? Who borrows morality and, and how? Justice system. Justice system, yes. So let's say, uh, let's say you got an atheist who believes that we are just, uh, we are just particles in motion, right? That's how we came to be, is just lots of matter and material just banging together and eventually out come us. And then we somehow, and then, uh, how should I say this? And then he cries out for justice when his wallet gets stolen or when he's sinned against or when something bad happens to him. He says, this is wrong, this is evil. But then we say, wait a minute, your worldview can't account for this. If we're all just matter in motion, as you, be, as you say you believe, uh, you, can't, you can't cry out for justice because there is no justice or right or wrong in your worldview. So what they say they believe, let's just put this in quotes, what they say they believe is not truly how they live. Okay, so... They believe, they say they believe one thing. We're just, we're just random. We, we came from nothing. But they live very different than that. They live very different. Um, what's another example? Uh, when a scientist uh, who believes that uh, everything came from nothing, right? We are, we are, we are a process, uh, or we just came from randomness. Let's just say randomness. That's what they'll say, randomness. And spontaneity. Spontaneity. Is that right? Okay. Okay, thanks. Spontaneity. Okay. Uh, we, we all just come from a big bang, right? Everything came from nothing. Um, and yet they live knowing that there is uniformity to nature. This is just a random example. Uh, they know the sun will rise tomorrow. They, they know. They know. Um, there's no reason to believe that the sun will rise tomorrow if there's uniformity to nature. They can't account for the sun rising tomorrow like we can. Uh, do you guys know why we can account, or why we have a, a reason to believe that? Uh, why do we know the sun will rise tomorrow? Do we know? Because God is in control. Yes, let's get more specific. What did God s say to Noah? In Genesis 8, Genesis 8, 22. Let me read it for you guys. This is the Noahic Covenant. Genesis 8, verse 22. So he makes the covenant, I'll, I'll never again destroy every living thing as I've done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and wheat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Okay, so until uh, all things come to an end in God's plan, everything's gonna continue just as it is. Okay, we can account for this. We can account for a uniformity to nature that those who believe in a big bang and, and randomness and chance and all those things, that just everything came out of nothing, they can't do that. So they're borrowing and they're living as if, uh, they're, they're, they're borrowing from our worldview. So what's another example? Um, let's see. So let me just make this more clear. So let's go back to the morality. Some people that like pictures. Okay, so this is matter in motion. Let's just draw arrows. They're going in motion. Okay, that's matter in motion. And uh, that's what they believe. We're just matter in motion, and then we just, we, we've, we, we've come to this point in our life where matter in motion has led to, let's say, truth, morality. I hope you guys can read this intelligence, logical thinking, etc. Uh, 
matter in motion has led to that, and this is scientific, right? This is called evolution, whatever. This is what they're taught in schools. Uh, and then, so how, how foolish is this? I mean, let's, let's talk about, I use this with my kids, the students. Pardon my drawing. Imagine I had two Coke cans, okay? These are two Coke cans. Can you guys see? They got matter in them. Let's say I shake them up. Which one is right and which one is wrong? That's what they're saying. Okay, if I shake it up enough over time, this one's good, this one's bad. This is where morality comes from. We have to show them that their worldview uh, is just absurd. It falls on its face. Um, this is what they say they believe, but they live differently. Um, they claim that there is, well, if they do claim that there is truth, they claim that there is right and wrong. They claim to know things. Matter can't know things, okay? So they're borrowing from our worldview. Okay, now, it, is this biblical? Okay, is what I'm saying biblical? Is, is pointing out borrowing biblical? I was reading Acts 17, and uh, we'll get there. Uh, we'll, we'll exposit it more another week. But Acts 17, Paul, on, uh, was it Mars Hill? On Mars Hill, he points out borrowing on verse 28. <clears throat> he says, In him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said. Okay, so is Paul just trying to find common ground with these people? No, he's not trying to find common ground. He's saying, you know this God. This God is close to you. And yes, uh, even though you know he's the God of gods, even your own poets have said, in him we live and move and have our being. What other God is like this? And yet you treat him as unknown. This is a rebuke. This is a rebuke. Paul is rebuking them for treating this God as unknown, this, this God who is bigger than all the other gods, the God who gives life and movement and holds all things together. Um, so he's saying, you are, you are borrowing from our God and yet denying that he exists. That's what they're doing. Okay? Maybe I've, I've hammered, I've, I've kicked a dead horse at this point. So someone will say, wait a minute, I've, I'm here to learn how to win someone to Christ not to the Christian worldview. This is unbiblical. Okay, so to that I have to say, you can't have a truly Christian worldview uh, apart from saving faith in Christ. So we're not trying to win them to our way of thinking per se. We are trying to point out the absurdity of what they've come to believe and show them that they are actively suppressing the truth in unrighteousness and then call them to repent. That's what we're trying to do in, in, in apologetics. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, yes, good, good. Okay, so that's what we're doing. It's not that we're trying to be super smart and win arguments. Uh, we're trying to win them to Christ. So if this is confusing to you, I've seen, I'm seeing a lot of bing, 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 bing. Um, hang in there. Uh, as we talk about this more and more in the coming weeks, uh, it'll, it'll make sense. It'll just connect those dots, okay? So let's look at an example in scripture. We'll get to Paul's apologetics in chapter, uh, week five, I think we'll hit chapter four of Odie Bauckham's book. Uh, but for now, let's look at just one example from Jesus himself. In Matthew 22, or Matthew 12, 22. Let's go there now. Matthew 12, 22. <clears throat> I'll read it to you guys. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed them so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? Okay, here's a, here's a claim. Listen to this. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Okay, that is a, that is a truth claim, they are, it's really false, but it is a truth claim. That Jesus only casts out demons by the ruler of the demons, okay? So how does Jesus respond to this truth claim? Let's see. Uh, number one, Jesus first shows the absurdity, the absurdity of that claim. 
Verse 25, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Okay, guys, your claim is absurd. That's what he's saying. It's a, that's absurd. Uh, number two, Jesus shows the inconsistency, inconsistency of the Pharisees' claim. If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. Okay? You, you guys are being inconsistent with your claim. Number three, Jesus then brings the truth to bear upon the argument, the truth. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, which is the only logical conclusion, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Implication, you need to repent. Implication, I am the Christ. Implication, repent. Jesus did this kind of thing all the time in the scriptures. He shut the mouth of his opponents and left no excuse for not believing in him. So that's, that's the place for apologetics in Jesus' uh, in uh, the example of Christ. So why should we be engaged in apologetics and evangelism? Can you guys guess the first one? Number one? Glory. For the glory. For the glory of God. Thank you. Yes, God's purpose in all things is his glory and salvation glorifies the Lord and hardening of the heart also glorifies the Lord, Romans 9, and uh, the, the display of his justice on hard hearts glorifies him. So even if they're saved and if they're not, he is glorified. And faithfulness to proclaim him glorifies him as well. So glory, the glory of God um, Number two, Scripture commands the church to be engaged in apologetics and evangelism. Scripture commands the church, and we see this on page 15. Uh, side note, let's talk about the purpose of the church. As, as we're gathered here together as an assembly, what is the purpose of the church? Let's just simplify it for everybody. The purpose of the church uh, is to exalt the sovereign Lord, number one, we are here to uh, exalt him. Uh, number two, to edify the saint. And number three, to evangelize the sinner. That's, that's as simple as you can get for the purpose of the church. Exalt Christ, edify the saint, and evangelize the sinner. Okay, Matthew 28, Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and he says, go Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. What's the implication? How do you make disciples? Do they, do they just come through your door and like, hey, I'm, a, I'm an unbeliever, but I, I just, I just want to, I don't know anything about what you guys are doing, but I just want to be a part of this and, and believe whatever you believe. That doesn't happen. We have to go, right? We have to go out, right? Okay, yes. We have to go out and evangelize. That's how we make disciples, proclaiming him. Okay, that's implied in this, um, in this disciple making. While we're going, we are making disciples. While we're going and preaching and proclaiming, we're making disciples. First Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen family, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that, this is why a reason why you were saved, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is one of the purposes of, of why your heart is still beating and you're not with him in heaven now, so that you can proclaim him. 1 Peter 3.15, uh, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense, okay? Uh, this, is, this is for the church. We need to always be ready, and again, we will discuss that text in length another time. Number three, the example. The example of the early church in apologetics and evangelism. Uh, Acts 8, those who had been scattered. So this is the whole church being scattered. Uh, persecution is coming. Only the, the apostles remain, I think, in Jerusalem. And the whole church scatters. And what do they do? They proclaim the good news of the word. Acts 5, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. This is just natural for believers. 
This is what we do. We go out, and as we go out, we proclaim. This is what we do. Uh, Number four, the experience of the church. Uh, They experienced uh, growing numbers. And the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Again, the implication is that they were evangelizing as they were going out, as they were doing church together and going out and coming back and going out and coming back. The Lord was adding to their number. So here's a question. Uh, Why is the church still on earth? What are we doing? What are we doing? Uh, Why are we here? Can we worship better here than in heaven? No? Okay. Can we be more like Christ here than in heaven? No? Okay, okay, what are we doing? Can we evangelize better here than in heaven? Okay, yes, yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, So we're meant to exalt Christ. Yes, we can do that better up there. And we are meant to grow in holiness. Uh, I'll be way better up there. Um, But we are here to evangelize. And we won't be caught up until the last one has come in. Okay, so this is our purpose as the church, to go and evangelize. Okay, so what is the biblical motivation for apologetics and evangelism? What is our motivation? Uh, Number one, love for... Oh yeah, a lot for a lot, a lot of people. Love for God and slash Christ. That's number one. We'll get to more loves later. Love for God slash Christ. I want my king to be honored. I want all of creation to bend the knee to his lordship. And uh, I want him to receive all the glory that he is worthy of. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is one of my favorite chapters in all of scripture. 2 Corinthians 5. You can't exhaust this chapter. Can't wait till we preach it. Verse 11. uh, Paul says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Now this this verse has been taken out of context and I'm not going to do that. Uh, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul is not talking about persuading unbelievers to believe. Uh, the context of 2 Corinthians is he's defending his, his apostolic authority to the church who is who's tempted to listen to outside voices calling them to believe a different gospel. Okay? So at the heart of this, yes, is the gospel. Um, I want you to believe that I'm an apostle because I want you to believe my message and my message is the gospel and I don't want you to go astray from the truth and the simplicity of the gospel. And so Paul defends himself. And so he's persuading them um, about his message. Um, But it's equally as true to say, and I think we can take application from this, uh, that knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing the terror, and knowing what awaits unbelievers, um, if they do not believe, uh, we should persuade them. We persuade them. Has anyone here read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? Okay, if you haven't, if you want motivation to evangelize, read it. Uh, read it once a month. Uh, there is nothing in my life that has uh, lit the fire. Uh, oh, okay, uh, no pun intended. Lit the fire under me uh, than to read about sinners in the hands of an angry God. They are held above the flames every moment. And uh, if we knew their condition, we would evangelize. If we just had a picture, and if we got a taste of, if, if, if their heart would stop where they would be, uh, we would evangelize. Um, if you see someone in a burning building, and you know their condition, and they're not aware of their condition, and you see them in the window, and you're like, oh, I don't want to offend them. They look like they're having fun, and their happiness, and whatever, and you don't say anything. And you know that if they stay in that condition, they will burn. They will burn up. And you know the only route to escape. You know the door. And you don't call out. That's not loving. So we should see, when we we look at unbelievers, when we look at our neighbors, see them in their true condition as held over the flames and they're unaware of it. Okay? And then love calls out. I'm actually getting into the next one. Actually, two... 
Number four, I think, love for neighbor. Um, So love for neighbor. Uh, Love for neighbor calls out, love your neighbor as yourself. Here's a question for you. Uh, Do you want eternal life? Do you want that? I hope so. Yeah, okay. Uh, Looking back in hindsight, um, would you wish, well, I guess you have heard, but do you wish that someone would have told you sooner about Christ if you came late like I did? No one has ever told me the gospel before I was saved. No one ever did. I read it in here by God's grace in Providence. Uh, I picked up a Bible and started reading. But I wish that someone would have come to me and told me the gospel. Um, and so when, when you think of your, when you're, of your neighbor, think, what would I wish that someone would do for me? If that was me and I wasn't saved, what, do I, what would I want someone to do for me? Take me by the head like, and look at me in the eyes and say, you, brother, are in a terrifying condition right now. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let's talk. I mean, don't do that literally, but that's what I want. I would want someone to do for me. Stop me in my tracks and bring me this way. Compel me to come into the kingdom uh, by any means necessary. Um, okay, so that's number four. We skip number two. Nope. Number three. Uh, love of Christ. Love of Christ. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, if you're still there, verse 14. What else motivates him? He says, the love of Christ controls us. And then he concludes with this, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So this is not our love for Christ. This is Christ's love for us. Now, how does Christ's uh, saving particular love compel us to evangelize? And I say saving in particular because that's what the text says. Um, Verse 14, the love of Christ controls us having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. In other words, all those for whom he died, died with him and they will be saved. So I've, I've preached on this recently, sovereignty and evangelism. How does Christ's love for us or for the elect or for all those for whom he died motivate us to say, be reconciled to God, to a group of people, uh, to, or to the church, or to uh, a gathering of unbelievers. Um, what is it? I know it's, it takes a couple, you know, neurons to connect for me too. What's that? Love. love? Yeah, the love of Christ, that it's already accomplished, that it's already accomplished. He has secured the salvation of all those for whom he died, and I just need to say to anybody, I don't know who it is, but I know that he secured it, and I can water, I can plant, but God will give the increase to his elect, and uh, I can be a means uh, to save uh, a sheep for whom he died. Um, So that's what Paul is saying. The love of Christ controls me because I've concluded that he died for all those for whom he died. He died for his elect, and they will be saved. Okay, made new in due time. And so be reconciled. We beg you. We, we beg you. And it goes together. Uh, pleading with people and also knowing the sovereignty of God and saving. I don't want to uh, take too long on that one. Okay. Um, okay, compassion. Let's go to, uh, back to the neighbor, actually. I missed Matthew 12. And seeing the crowds, this is Jesus, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Um, When you see a crowd of unbelievers, what do you think? What do you think? Do you think, uh, look at those, look at those wicked sinners. I thank God I'm not like them. Is that what you think? Oh, may it never be. May it never be. Were it not for the grace of God, there go I, right? That's where I would be. That's where I would be. Have compassion on them. Have compassion on them. Number five, uh, eternal rewards. This is biblical. This is biblical. A motivation to evangelize is clearly laid out in the Bible uh, as eternal rewards. Eternal rewards. John 4, behold, Jesus says, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest Even now he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal. 
so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Okay, he's talking about evangelism. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Everyone change that. Thank you, brother. 936. What's 1236? Nothing? Okay. <laughs> huh. Okay, neurons connecting. 1 Corinthians 3. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Uh, they're servants through whom you believed. We were the means through whom you were saved. Uh, even as the Lord gave to each one, the Lord gave. I planted, yes, Apollos watered, and we were both preaching the gospel, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward, his own reward according to his labor. Gold, silver, precious stone, he goes on to say. Wood, hay, stubble uh, for what's not done for Christ. This is in the context of evangelism. Okay, so receiving wages, gathering fruit for life eternal, rewards, motivation to evangelize. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, again, uh, here's some context for verse 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So recompensed for his deeds in the body, rewarded. This is the Bema seat. This is not judgment. This is rewards. This is no condemnation. So then, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Okay, see the connection there? Okay, number six, my favorite. Well, they're all my favorite. Uh, number six, because we simply delight in the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you love something, your automatic reaction is to say, have you tried this? It is so good. Or have you seen this movie? It's amazing. Or whatever, right? You guys do this. Have you met this guy? Oh, you gotta talk to him, he's amazing. Uh, when you love something, your automatic reaction is to want to share, okay? And same for the Christian. We love Christ more than anything. And our natural response, wherever we go, is to, is to want to, oh, I wanna tell you. I just want to, I delight so much in the gospel of my Savior, and I love him. And I want you to know this man, this God, this God-man. I want you to know my King and my Savior, my Lord. So that's just, I can't teach that. That's got to be in here. I, yeah, so what is our goal? What is our goal in apologetics and evangelism? It's to show how smart we are, right? Okay, good. I'm glad we got that. Okay, no, it's, it's not to show how smart we are. The goal of apologetics is not to win people to theism. I'm, I'm, I'm making a point to... Mention this, theism, I'll spell it here. Uh, T-H-E, theism, theism. Uh, did, who knows what theism is? And why am I saying this? Theism, and we'll get to this later. Um, you, guys, you guys have heard of classical apologetics? Classical? Um, the teleological argument, the cosmological argument, the transcendental argument, all these philosophical arguments for the existence of God a God, God, uh, not particularly the biblical God, not the Christian God, just God meh, out there. Uh, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And there's a reason for that, and we'll get there. But I wanted to just have that on your radar. Uh, we're not causing, uh, we're not uh, seeking uh, their faith in just a deity, just a creator, a part that's just separate from this. Um, no, we are connecting, uh, we, want, we are talking about Yahweh here, a particular God, this God, this very God, not just God, random. You can fill in the blanks with this God, just believe in God. Uh, people say that all the time as you, as you talk, with, I believe in God. Which one? Uh, which one? Do you, do you believe in Yahweh, that one, Jesus, him? So we're not seeking to win them to theism, as we, uh, as we engage with them. Yes? That's one of the weaknesses of intelligent design, right? If, if you just have this intelligent design case study, right. you're, not, you're not going far enough. Yeah. Right? It is you know, helpful in some way 
Right. But it's like it doesn't go far enough. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Like that's part of the, um, what did I just say? Uh, one of the arguments. Uh, man, neurons. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, intelligence design. Yeah. Higher power. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, okay, I just really want you to believe in a higher power because that will really help you. If you just believe in a God, you know, just believe in God, that'll help you. Uh, okay, got to be more specific. Got to be more specific. Um, yeah, I just want you to really believe it, that, that we are created. They know, right? They know that already. Romans 1, they know. Well, we'll get there. Um, so people are trying very hard to prove that there is a God, and yet the Bible says they know already. They know already, okay? So we don't want to waste our time uh, doing that. Um, so we'll get there, though, but that's a good point. That's a good point. All right. What would you guys come up with? Is it our goal to win souls? Yes, no, yes or no, yes and no. Maybe. Sort of. Kind of. What would you guys come up with? We can't win souls. Okay. You guys agree with that? But supernatural. supernatural work. Good. Yeah. Supernatural work of God. What did you guys put for the answer, by the way? Yes? No? Yes and Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> okay, so no because we can't do it. It must be the Lord. Why yes? Yes. That's what we want to see. That's the goal. That's the goal. Even though we can't do it, that's, that's our goal. That's our motivation. Uh, I want to win you. We see this in, in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 19 through 22. He says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. Uh, to the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, uh, so that I might win those who are under the law. Uh, to those who are without law, as without law, uh, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that's confusing, uh, so that I might win those who are without the law. Um, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may, by all means, save some. Okay, and Paul knows more than anybody that he can't save anybody, and yet he still desires to win and to save, and that's, that's fair to say. That's fair to say, I seek to win you. I want to win souls. I want to be a soul winner for Christ. Uh, and yet I know I can't do a thing. So you guys nailed it. Yes and no. How do you know, this is probably a bit harder, if you've been successful, I should have put quotes, successful in your apologetics and evangelism. How do you know? If someone responds well, if someone is saved, were you successful? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, did you guys all hear that? Okay, so he says, regardless of the outcome, as long as we are faithful, essentially, uh, to uh, the message and to proclaim the truth, that is success. Regardless of whether or not they are saved, um, leave the outcome to the Lord. Um, would you guys agree with that? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, he's glorified in their salvation, and he's glorified in their hardening, right? I heard Pharaoh talked about over here, I think. You guys were talking about Pharaoh. And how he is exalted. The Yahweh exalted himself in hardening Pharaoh's heart and display, displaying his power. Um, so he's, he's uh, I mean, think of uh, Jeremiah, right? How many years of ministry? 50 some? Uh, no converts, but he was faithful. I'd call that a successful ministry. Okay, so uh, you will, when we start going out, and as you're going out on your own, uh, there will be a lot of, don't talk to me, there will be a lot of uh, failures, as it were. Not failures. Not failures. If you're faithful to go out and uh, be there and just honor Christ 
and uh, seek to win souls, that is success. And you're doing it in a, in a Christ, uh, Christ-like way, um, biblical manner. So faithfulness to Christ is success. Whatever, come what may, right? Come what may. And uh, we comfort ourselves in the sovereignty of God when people are not uh, you know, bending the knee to Christ as soon as we're done talking with them and, and crying out for the Lord to save them. Um, that is rare, right? We, don't, we want that and we hope for that and love hopes all things, um, but we know that it must be the Lord. And so we may just plant and we may just water and God may give the increase to someone else. Um, and uh, that's okay. We're just faithful. We're faithful and we leave it all to the Lord. So number two, we skip number two and three. The goal of apologetics is to get to the gospel. That's the whole point. We, just, we don't just tear down their speculations and leave them in the dirt. We build them up in the truth of the gospel. Get to the gospel. That's the whole point. Uh, the goal of apologetics, number three, is to see that Christ is honored. Honored. This is so important. Uh, I want my king to be honored in your thoughts, in your worldview, and, and, and everything in your life. Oh, I wish that he is. Uh, we, we feel that with our family and friends and those close to us, those that we love. We wish that they would uh, be in, aligned with uh, the honoring of Christ. Uh, I mean, not that, that they just make them happier, um, but we love our king, and that's what we want every knee to, bow, uh, to bend before him. Yeah. Yes. In the context of politics, right? So a lot of times it's a clash of worldviews. Hmm. as its aim. Mm. And uh, this nation will not be rescued with Republicans converting Democrats to become Republicans. Mm -hmm. That is not going to change anything. Right. Ultimately. Right. What they need is Christ. Yes. Right? So that's why it's so important when we're talking about views. Right. The aim is Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, that's why we're seeking to tear down the worldview and build them up and get them to the gospel because the, it, it's... I don't want you just to agree with me. I want you to be saved. I want you to be made new completely. And so I'm gonna get to the gospel because I know that that is the means that God will use, that God can use to transform your heart from the inside out. Um, it's not enough that you just believe with me politically or just agree with what I say. I don't want that if you don't, uh, in your heart, submit to the Lordship of Christ. So that's a great point, brother. Thank you for that. Okay, I have homework for you guys. For the next eight, nine, ten weeks, this is due and whenever we are done here. Uh, I won't fail anybody, but, you know, it's there. Um, I want you guys, in the course of our time together, to identify three unbelievers that you will commit to praying for every single day. Write them down here, write them down um, in your journal, wherever, um, and pray for them every single day. Choose one of those unbelievers to interview uh, to interview, and I've given you the questions, and you can add questions if you want. Um, uh, use, use this, and I, I'm giving you uh, a reason to go preach the gospel to him or, or share the gospel with him. This is a good opportunity. You, you could say, my pastor is making me do this. I gotta, I gotta tell you the gospel, and, and I gotta hear from you. I wanna hear where you are in your worldview. Um, and then afterwards, you can say, well, uh, that's, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. That's so helpful. Uh, do you mind if I, if I share what I believe about these things? Great opportunity to get the gospel. I'm giving you guys an out, or an in, I should say, an open door. Just, just blame your pastor, okay? Use this as an excuse to get the gospel to that one person you're praying for. You can even make this, you can even do two or three and, and interview them as well. Um, so that's there for you. Uh, let's see what else I want to do for you. Uh, okay. We have uh, these cards here, uh, Christ, or God, man, Christ, sinner. Um, can someone pass these out, actually? Sorry, got a lot of things to pass out. Um, yeah, John, thank you, brother. If there's not enough, let me know. I have more in my office. In seminary, we are required to memorize this. Every seminary student has to memorize this. Um, this is so helpful. I, I, I didn't realize how helpful this would be until I got out there. Uh, evangelizing. This is the outline that is in your head as you're seeking to guide the conversation to the gospel, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll, 
explain this more in due time uh, in the weeks to come. But just have this on your radar. Be memorizing this in your free time. Um, maybe take just, you know, parts at a time. That's what I did. I just started with God, man, Christ, sinner. Okay. God, man, Christ, sinner. Okay. God, man, Christ, sinner. And then you can get to God, and then there's three, three bold points there. And just memorize those three bold points. And then maybe in due time, memorize the scripture that goes with it. Okay. Okay. And then as you're evangelizing, these things will come into your thoughts, and, you, and uh, they will guide your conversation. Start here, okay? Um, I've, in my time evangelizing, that, this has been so helpful. If I started somewhere else, I would have to go back here and explain why um, I'm saying what I'm saying. So it's just helpful to start here. And we'll get to that in due time, but have this be memorizing that um, gospel tracks, this should be a part of every Christian's uniform. You should have these in your wallet, in your pocket, in your car, uh, wherever you go. I have tons of gospel tracks. Um, this, is, this one's very simple. Um, I wish I had this part of my uniform the other day. Um, there are times when you're busy and someone else is busy and you don't have time to talk to them, but you know you'll never see them again, or maybe you will in God's providence. But you have to say, oh, I really want to chat with you. Um, I just want you to know I'm a Christian and uh, I just want to share this with you. Would you take it, please, and would you read it? And uh, so if you don't have time, this is an easy way. Uh, to get the gospel to people. And if they say, I don't want it, just say, that's fine, just take it. And if they say, I'll throw it away, and that's fine, that's fine, just take it, just throw it away, just take it. And they put it in their pocket, and they may throw it away, they may not, but uh, if they throw it away, maybe the wind will blow it, or the crow will get it, and someone else will find it. Um, so that's there for you, come pick them up if you want. Uh, here is something to look at, I only have one of these. 100 reasons and ways to use gospel tracks. There's a lot of reasons to use gospel tracks, and uh, you can take a picture of this. Uh, let that convince you that you should use gospels or gospel tracks. Um, let's see. Okay, I think. Okay, one more thing. Uh, I want you to think. I have in, in my concluding notes. Think of some of the hardest apologetic questions that you have faced, or apologetic questions you would like to know how to answer, and then email them to me. Uh, my email is right there. And I'm going to try to address every single one of those questions over the course of these nine weeks, okay? Um, so this isn't, you know, stump the pastor, but uh, this is legitimately, like, okay, I'm, I'm facing this, or I can, I can foresee me facing this kind of a question, and, or I'm just imagining, how, I don't know how I would even answer that. Email that to me, um, and we'll, we'll try to address that over these nine, ten weeks, or eight weeks. Not sure. We'll see how long we go. Uh, we, hmm, no time for questions. Why don't you guys just take some time now, pray for one another, um, pray for specific things, but also pray specifically for the things that we have talked about here today in apologetics and evangelism. So go ahead and do that.